Good day. This is the recorded lecture for Chapter 5, scheduled for the, week, the third week of the class. And Chapter 5 talks about the biomes. You will recognize this slide from the last chapter. We ask the question, why so many species? We examine the mechanisms of how we have so many species. Another part of the answer is that we have so many diverse environments around the world. When you combine the mechanisms we discussed in the last chapter and the great diversity of environments around the biosphere in this chapter, I think you will begin to see why we have such a marvelous diversity on our planet. I've added some inserts of the environment onto the same slide with a couple of these species. So it's pretty obvious that the polar bear is, op is adapted to an extreme environment, which is mostly polar ice. And if you look at the Venus flytrap here, it's a plant largely adapted to the tropics. Why so many environments? Well, the simple answer is the Earth is round. Day lengths are different at different latitudes and over the seasons of the year. Global climate patterns affect the distribution of heat, precipitation, and currents distribute warm versus cold water around the oceans and by the land masses. So chapter 5 discusses the biomes of the Earth. Biomes are defined as broad types of biological communities. They can either be terrestrial or aquatic. We're going to start with the terrestrial biomes, and then we're going to move to the aquatic biomes. This is a map shown in your book of the different biomes and their distribution around the world. Note quickly that if you analyze some of these color patterns, you'll see them in, in fairly similar places. If you look at the latitude bars going horizontally around this map. And at some level, you can also see the uh, distribution, some similarities in the distribution where you can find these um, different biomes at certain parts of the continents. Let's look at the biomes another way in this chart. This chart shows annual precipitation from wet to dry and average temperature from hot to cold. And you can see how the distribution of the different biomes occurs with these variables. Temperature and precipitation are the most important determinants in biome distribution on land, that is, our terrestrial biomes. We have discussed primary productivity and photosynthesis. The most favorable environment for photosynthesis produces the most primary productivity. Most warm environments are ideal, producing lots of plant biomass, which in turn produces more animal life. So this chart illustrates this concept. Changes in elevation also substitute for distribution of moisture and temperature around the biosphere. This diagram illustrates how elevation changes vegetation patterns in our own state, looking from Fresno in the valley up to Mount Whitney in the central Sierras. Moisture availability depends on temperature as well as precipitation. The horizontal axis on these climate diagrams shows the months of the year the vertical axes show temperature on the left side, 
and precipitation on the right. The number of dry months are shaded in yellow, and the better months are shaded in blue. Year, yearly annual temperature and precipitation are shown at the top of the graph. We'll use these graphs as we go through the discussion of the different biomes. Take a moment to study these. So now we're going to go through the different terrestrial biomes, followed by the aquatic biomes. Tropical forests cluster near the equator. I'm using a, a slide, set of slides from another textbook just to illustrate how the distribution of tropical forests can show on the world map that we just looked at, but just the tropical forests alone. This is the slide showing the graphing technique in your book. Tropical rainforests have luxuriant and d diverse plant growth. Heavy rainfall occurs in most months, shown in the climate graph. Because it's warm and because day lengths are somewhat equal, this is ideal for plants, really. And so tropical forests typically have luxurious and abundant plant growth. This is another set of my own slides just to review some of the properties that you can find of the different biomes. So we'll review these. So looking at the tropics, the temperatures are warm. Day lengths are about equal all year round. The rainfall can vary within a fairly wet um, range. So tropical forests can have wet and dry variations. Rainfall ranges from between 70 and 150 inches a year. The soil is poorly developed because of the warmth. Decomposition is so rapid, and a lot of leaching occurs by rainfall. So nutrients tend to be a bit of a problem in, in terms of overall availability. And what nutrients there are, they're quickly taken up by the lush vegetation. The type of vegetation we get in tropical forests is multiple layers, also with climbing vines and epiphytes such as orchids and bromeliads. Because of this type of environment, it explains why we have more coniferous plants in these types of situations. So nutrients are very limiting. Coniferous plants have evolved the ability to supplement their diet, um, particularly for nitrogen, which is limiting in these systems, by preying on insects. Other animal life tends to include lots of climbing animals, such as monkeys, snakes, frogs, and lots of, lots of insects and fruit-eating animal life. So let's look at savannas and grasslands. These t tend to be tropical. Savannas, savannas are characterized by scattered trees with open uh, areas of grassland underneath. Savannas are typically dry and warm. And again, on this slide, you can see where most of the large savanna biomes occur. Tropical savannas and grasslands experience annual drought in rainy seasons and year-round temperatures. Trees tend to be thorny acacias, and abundant grazers survive on the grasslands in these types of savannas. 
Notice the yellow areas that show when there's a moisture deficit. So looking at savannas, the characteristics of this biome, they're warm year-round. The rainfall is much less compared to our tropical forest that we just looked at, 11 to 20 inches per year. There's a dramatic range or variation of rainfall over the season. Soils generally are too poorly developed for trees because of this low rainfall. Many of the plants are adapted to prolonged dry periods. They'll grow rapidly during the rainy season. Grasses are an example of plants that are adapted to seasonal variation in rainfall and relatively low rainfall amounts. But because grasses are in the, un in the understory of these systems, they tend to support many grazing animals. Grasses have a growing point, as I already mentioned in the previous chapter, under below ground. So it withstands temperature extremes, fire, and grazing pressure. Vegetation generally is grasses with occasional trees. In this picture here, I show you a California savanna, our oak savannas, which are similar to um, some of the African savannas in terms of their basic characteristics of the biome. As you can see from the previous two pictures, these areas tend to support lots of burrowing animals and also grazing animals. Deserts are our next biome. They're defined by their dryness. The deserts are our driest biomes. The deserts tend to occur in two types of places. They are, if you can see their distribution along the latitude of the Earth. They tend to occur between the tropics and between the temperate zones where large masses of dry air, air descend over the, um, the continents. This is because of sort of global climatic circulation uh, patterns. Also, they tend to occur behind large mountain ranges in what we call the rain shadow. So deserts generally receive very small amounts of precipitation per year. Hot deserts, as in the American Southwest, endure year-round drought and extreme heat in the summer. So let's look at the characteristics of deserts. Again, very low rainfall, less than 10 inches per year. In some deserts, such as in Central Australia and Africa, less than one inch of year, one inch of rainfall occurs per year. And the Atacama Desert in Chile is famous because it does not get rain for decades. Deserts tend to occur, as I said, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south in latitude and behind mountainous rain, behind mountainous areas in what we call rain shadows. Deserts can actually, are generally hot, but they can be hot or cold in certain seasons. And they also have extreme temperature fluctuations during the day. Plant growth is key to rainfall. And there's also an abundance of what we call C4 plants, which are uniquely adapted to uh, conducting photosynthesis under dry conditions. You might want to look up th that up if you're interested. The vegetation tends to include very deep-rooted shrubs with waxy protection on the leaves or succulents like cac cactus plants. They produce huge quantities of seed that can handle dryness and germinate whenever there's any moisture. Animal life tends to occur, tends to include lots of burrowing uh, organisms that can escape the heat during the day, um, seed feeders, and um, reptiles, and other relatively small 
uh, species. You don't find any really large animals in the desert. Chaparral is a um, type of biome that I'm going to introduce for this chapter because it's a important community in California in particular. Um, it's treated a little differently in your book. Spiny shrubs dominate the chaparral. The chaparral is found in uh, cool places with cool rainy winters and hot, dry hot summers. We call that the Mediterranean climate. You can see from the map here the areas where we can f you can find chaparral. As I said, this chaparral is found in these Mediterranean type climates with cool air from the ocean producing cool wet winters followed by hot dry summers. Rainfall is slightly better than the desert, 20 to 30 inches, but it only comes in the winter season. Temperatures range during the year from very hot to very cold. So this type of environment produces these spiny fire adapted shrubs. It's not enough moisture to support trees. And these shrubs are very adapted to extended the extended six month dry season. In chaparral, fire is very, very much a part of the adaptations that the vegetation has to um, be, uh, be prepared for. And as you know, living in California, that fire is a very uh, in common occurrence in our state. This is a burn scar in uh, Santa Barbara from a satellite fo photo. And you can see that um, a lot of the burn area is actually in the chaparral part of the vegetation that occurs in the mountains above Santa Barbara. Temperate grasslands or grasslands include uh, our, the North American prairie and other prairies around the world. You can see from the map the types of places that they tend to occur. They're found where winters are very cold. So the grasslands typically are found at mid-latitudes on all continents, just, just like North America. They're, the grasslands are kept open by extreme temperatures, dry conditions, periodic fires so that trees are just generally not able to um, make a go of it in these types of systems. However, they have high plant and animal diversity. Looking again at the characteristics of grasslands, they're found in regions of cold winter temperatures where rainfall is relatively low, 10 to 29 inches, too low to support trees. There are periods of severe droughts. The soils are enriched from rapid decomposition and abundance of organic matter over time. So our grasslands, our temperate grasslands, tend to be the bread baskets of the world. These types of biomes are dominated by grasses, and you can get trees, but generally only along streams and rivers. So our American prairies are examples. There are also prairies around the world. Um, we also have a coastal prairie variant in California. These systems are also adapted to fire. This last picture that you see here at the bottom is a prescribed fire being done at a prairie restoration program that I was involved in when I was a student in college and all is still going on to this to this day.
Now we're going to look at the broadleaf temperate forests. Temperate broadleaf forests grow throughout the mid-latitude regions, just like the prairies, but where there's sufficient moisture to support the growth of large trees. So they tend to occur in the more rainier or eastern sides of the great grassland prairies. Temperate deciduous forests have year-round precipitation, but winters that are really cold near or below freezing. So the characteristics of the temperate deciduous forests are mid-latitudes in both hemispheres. Temperatures range from very hot to very cold. Look at the rainfall. It's 30 to 60 inches, somewhat higher than the other systems that we've talked about other than the tropical forest. So this is enough, enough moisture to support trees. The rainfall is also evenly distributed throughout the year, which is also helpful to supporting trees. But these biomes have to get through a shorter growing season, which is five to six months, and a very cold winter. So the trees drop their leaves and become dormant during the winter. By shedding their leaves, the trees cannot transpire, hence containing its water through the winter. Vegetation, then, is mostly deciduous. You'll maybe recognize uh, a few dominants like oak trees, hickory, maples, those kinds of trees. The type of animal life includes a lot of tree um, species such as squirrels and um, some grazing animals, particularly browsers like deer that can eat uh, the low-level branches, low-level low uh, browse that's available in these systems. Now we're going to look at the coniferous forests. The coniferous forests are often dominated by a few species of trees, and they're um, mostly conifers as opposed to deciduous broadleaf trees. There's a couple of terms used, the northern coniferous forest or taiga. The taiga can be a cooler variant of the coniferous forest under some treatments. You can see from the map where they occur around the world. Temperate forests have abundant but often seasonal precipitation that supports magnificent trees and luxuriant understory vegetation. Some of the forests exhibit uh, dry summers, but generally most of the winter is cold to very cool, and sometimes the precipitation comes as snow in many of these systems. Your book also makes a distinction between the temperate forest and the boreal forests. Boreal forests have moderate precipitation but are often moist because temperatures are cold most of the year. So cold tolerant and drought tolerant conifers dominate the boreal forests and the taiga. So let's look at the coniferous forests and the, and the taiga as a lumped group and focus on the coniferous vegetation. So these, these types of areas are found in mountainous regions of North America but not South America. And the upper latitudes as you saw from the map. The, long, the winters are long, they're cold, and they're short. And they go from warm to cool, wet summers. Rainfall is 12 to 33 inches, 
and a lot of some of that precipitation falls as snow. Soils tend to be thin and acidic because the decomposition of conifers is very slow. So nutrients are very slowly released into the soil. Generally, most forests are dominated by a few conifer trees. In California, we have a coastal variant, our redwood, our redwoods and our Douglas fir and mixed conifer forest that you find both in California and Oregon. The nature of the coniferous vegetation, the needles, is generally unpalatable to most animals. So many of the animals you find in the coniferous forest are seed eaters, uh, many birds, and um, the, although you do find large grazers in these types of forests, they're generally um, occupying different um, habitats, transitional habitats near streams, meadows, um, aspen or poplar uh, groves that are not in the thick part of the coniferous forest. So this slide depicts the tundra. You can see the tundra is not found in the southern hemisphere, but it is found above the coniferous forest or taiga in the um, high northern latitudes of the northern hem hemisphere. The tundra supports a kind of a low um, shrubby type of growth and also supports uh, some mi the migratory mammals such as the caribou shown here. The other thing that characterizes the tundra is very cold, often permanently frozen soil. The growing season is very, very short. And this is what the, some of the migratory animals take advantage of that come up to the tundra. The permanently frozen subsoil in the tundra is called permafrost. The mean annual temperature in the tundra temperature, the mean annual temperature in the tundra is quite low, 16.7 degrees. Rainfall is 6 to 10 inches, so it's quite a dry environment, and much of this comes as snow. Soils are more or less permanently saturated because of low evapor evaporation rates due to the cold temperatures. The Days are very long in the summer. They're kind of the beginning of the midnight sun areas. And so the surface is warm for a short time. And the, sub, the soil melts for a short time for a growing season. But the subsoil remains permanently frozen. For this reason, the soils are very thin and poorly developed. Organic matter may be very high due to low decomposition rates. So the type of vegetation you get up here is dwarfs, shrubs, grasses, mosses, lichens, no trees. And uh, it's very hard to grow crops. It's a very short uh, season. I introduced this slide because, again, different, uh, different uh, Books and resources treat the biome slightly differently. This is a biome map that looks quite similar um, to the other maps that you've seen, but notice how Medi California has given its own uh, biome. This is because in California, we, because of the changes in ele elevation, we can see many of the biomes develop in a fairly short, uh, small area of geography. Now we're going to look at the aquatic biomes. While temperature and precipitation and moisture availability drive the broad vegetation types that we see in terrestrial systems, these drivers are quite different in aquatic systems. The drivers include 
salinity, depth of water, proximity to shore, wave action or water velocity, light penetration, and temperature. So the biome concept is still the same, but the actual determinants are quite different in aquatic biomes. We're going to look at the marine biomes first. I introduced this slide because I think it's useful to illustrate how the biomes are different in the oceans. So you can see that there's a wide range of different kinds of biomes having to do with the light penetration in the ocean and the substrate, and then, of course, exposure to tidal action. So study this uh, slide a little bit. We're just going to highlight some of the different types of aquatic uh, biomes, starting with tide pools. Tide pools are depressions in, rock, in a rocky shoreline that are flooded at high tide but remain retain some water at low tide. Wave action pre prevents most plant growth, although you do have some uh, types of plants that can survive in these environments. Particularly off Half Moon Bay, we uh, have some. There are, there's great diversity in the tide pools with specialized species adapted to these harsh conditions and relative degrees of tolerance of submergence versus emergence as the tidal patterns uh, change. On the right is a recent photo taken at extreme low tide at Pillar Point near Half Moon Bay. So you can see seagrass and you can also see uh, anemones similar to the anemone shown on the left here um, covering the substrate of the tide pools. We have great tide pooling in our county. So coral reefs, which we've already talked about, as a reminder, I'm going to put that unlabeled slide up again and our um, picture of bleached coral. Coral, coral reefs are, are among the most best known marine ecosystems because of their extraordinary biological productivity and their diverse and beautiful organisms, although I think tide pools rival the coral reefs too. Reefs are aggregations of minute colonial animals that we talked about, the coral polyps, that live symbiotically with photosynthetic algae, which are the dinoflagellates. Calcium-rich coral skeletons build up to make these reefs. And in some cases, they actually build atolls and islands that you can see from this picture. Reefs protect shorelines and shelter countless species of fish, worms, crustaceans, and other life forms. Reef-building corals live where water is shallow and clear enough for sunlight to reach the photosynthetic algae. They need warm but not too warm water, and they can't survive where high nutrient concentrations or runoff from the land create dense layers of algae, fungi, or sediment. As I have mentioned in several uh, presentations so far, coral reefs also are among the most endangered biomes in the world. They're subject to destructive fishing practices, polluted urban runoff, trash, sewage, industrial effluent, sediment from agriculture, and high human populations. Perhaps the greatest threat to the reefs is global war warming, which is I've mentioned. Elevated water temperatures are long, along with increasing acidity cause coral bleaching, shown in the slide, in which the corals expel their algal partners and then die. Also, I want you to note how important the productivity is of the coral and algal reefs from this uh, slide. 
noted by the yellow arrow. Other tidal environments include estuaries and salt marshes. The inset is a typical San Francisco Bay uh, marsh dominated by a plant called pickleweed with the salt marsh harvest mouse also an inset that is a en highly endangered species in our own bay. Estuaries are bays where rivers empty into the sea, so the, there's a mix of fresh water and salt water. Salt marshes are shallow wetlands flooded regularly or occasionally by seawater and occur on the coastlines. These areas are usually calm, warm, and nutrient rich and biologically diverse and productive. The rivers running into the estuaries provide nutrients and sediments <coughs> and a muddy bottom as you approach the river supports emergent plants. All of the, the so estuaries tend to support a whole host of other life forms including crustaceans, crabs, shrimp, mollusks, clams, and oysters. These are some photos, uh, aerial photos of estuaries and you can see how diverse and productive they can be because of the water regimes, the dissected nature of them and all of the various uh, places that organisms can inhabit. The um, I've included a picture of a somewhat unaltered um, estuary from Georgia and also an, a shot of the Sacramento estuary that you can see is uh, much altered by humans for commercial purposes, farming. And also there's a shot going back to our original case study of the Chesapeake Bay estuary as well. Nearly two-thirds of all marine fish and shellfish rely on estuaries and saline wetlands for spawning and juvenile, juvenile development. Estuaries near major American cities once supported an enormous wealth of seafood. One of the things that we're having uh, issues with now is that sewage and other contaminants eliminated most of these resources, but the ones that do remain are extremely important to our economy. As we talked in one of the earlier uh, chapters is major efforts are being made to revive the Chesapeake Bay and we're also working on the Sacramento, San Joaquin, San Francisco Bay estuary as well. Let's take a look at freshwater <coughs> biomes. This is a chart similar to the marine chart that I showed you of what, how uh, biomes are distributed, distributed in standing water environments or fresh, standing water freshwater environments or lakes. The layers of a deep lake are determined mainly by gradients of light, oxygen, and temperature. The epilimnion is affected by surface mixing from wind and thermal convections while mixing between the hypolimnion and the epilimnion is inhibited by a sharp temperature and density difference at what is called the thermocline. So all of these factors affect what kind of productivity you get in lakes, the open water portion, the littoral zone, and the emergent zone as you can see from this chart. So current sunlight and nutrients are important drivers or abiotic factors in how freshwater ecosystems develop. In addition to lakes, freshwater biomes also include streams and wetlands. The speed of water plays a key role in the removal and deposition of sediments in rivers and streams. Near the outer edge of a curve or a stream, a river or stream will erode the bank. 
However, in places where the river slows down, such as along the inside of the curves, sediment tends to be deposited. So you get these, this winding, meandering behavior of streams and rivers. Also, wetlands are a particular type of freshwater ecosystem where water drains into some kind of um, low spot. These areas tend to be very highly productive also. This table quantifies some the percent of human disturbance that we can find in these different types of systems. Humans have become dominant organisms over almost all the Earth, damaging or disturbing more than half of the world's terrestrial ecosystems to some extent. By some estimates, humans preempt about 40% of the net terrestrial primary productivity of the biosphere by either consuming it directly or by interfering with its production or use, or by altering the species composition or physical processes. Conversion of natural habitats to human uses is also the largest single cause of biodiversity losses. So as we start moving into other chapters, we'll begin talking about the great impact that humans have on many of these uh, natural phenomena and these natural systems. This ends the presentation for chapter 5.